we're very lucky to have Timo Swami from AMP International. He will be talking to us about acquiring and selling independent films during the pandemic. Thank you for the, the invite. Um, just the technical side, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Like I said, I work at um, AMP International. We're an um, independent uh, film sales company, international sales company. And uh, what that means is we um, represent the rights of filmmakers and producers, and uh, we then um, sell those rights globally, either as an all rights worldwide deal to a big streamer, like well, Netflix is obviously the one on everyone's mind, or uh, traditionally the model was that we would sell the rights uh, territory by territory, which, basically means country by country, but some language groups are uh, lumped into uh, sub territories. And um, then the individual distributor in each country would um, exploit the rights through theatrical, TV, DVD, VOD, and any other rights window that uh, is available to them. And uh, the way we work, and especially with the way I work, since I uh, work on the acquisitions and development side, at our company is uh, we keep in touch and have a growing network of uh, independent filmmakers, producers and uh, directors and writers who um, approach us or we approach them. And uh, we, to, from this pool, sort of select the projects we want to represent as an acquire to then represent internationally. And uh, we also help them with uh, creating the first marketing campaigns, which are usually more business to business. So they're, they're really the campaigns that the general public would see. They're mostly just for the industry, which would then traditionally, again, the traditionally is gonna be repeated a lot during this presentation. We would then go to markets and um, present them which, uh, to the buyers, network with new buyers, uh, network with uh, new producers as well. And, and this way help the films uh, travel internationally. Now, um, before I go deeper into how that market works, I thought I'd um, introduce us as a company a bit better so you understand what kind of a content space or segment of the market we um, exist in. So we've been operational for three years under this current name, uh, me and my uh, sales colleagues used to work at another company called the salt company and we were acquired by a larger company called alliance media partners and hence the uh, the new name um so we um specialize in um uh, english language films some are uh, more cast driven such as uh titles that you can see now we had uh, a film called miss you already a few years ago at Seoul starring Tony Collette and Drew Barrymore. There's a comedy, um, got dramas or drama comedies like The Grand Duke of Cor Corsica. But what's been our key focus for a long time has been um, genre films, such as um, The Anna and the Apocalypse, which is a Scottish film, um, and The Endless, which is, with Endless, which is a, sort of an art house science fiction film. That's because we've often found that the um, the genre market is quite vibrant and for an independent sales company, the, the, the business model of it is beneficial to smaller companies because they're less cast dependent. The, you, you sell the film more based on the premise and it, the, its execution or the concept and its execution, which again, I'll, I'll dig a bit deeper later on because that is one of the segments of the market that's been at least holding its own, maybe even thriving during the pandemic. And um, we can maybe discuss it a bit more in detail a bit later. Um, I myself, as I said, work mainly in the acquisitions and development side of our team, but because we're a small company, we all work across all departments. Uh, I have a background before working in international sales, working at a company called Altitude, which is a British company that also does sales, but also does uh, theatrical and uh, other forms of distribution purely in the UK. So I worked on the, uh, the documentary release, Amy, when it came out in the UK and uh, a few other smaller titles. And before that, 
I work in uh, film production in my native country, Finland. So I've got quite a broad scope of experiences across the industry. So I feel like I, at some times it's quite beneficial to connect the dots between the different parts of the industry, which especially in the pandemic and, and a sales role has been quite, quite helpful. So um, I'm fairly sure most of you are aware of the shift in online streaming that's happening in the entertainment sp space at the moment. So I'm not going to go too much into detail of it, but uh, I thought I'd give a bit of context so you get a sense of the how the transformation is happening specifically in this sector. And um, because the international sales sort of what happens in each country affects us, but similarly, Traditionally, we would sell country by country, and now with all these international streamers, that's going to affect us quite a bit as well. But I'll, I'll go through the sort of traditional model a bit more in detail, so we can then sort of go and uh, later discuss how it's been um, broken or disrupted recently. So as I said, traditionally, we would sell the films territory by ter territory or country by country to local distributors who then exploit the film rights in the territory, usually through theatrical, then it's followed by home entertainment, which is traditionally DVD sales, TV sales, then digital rental and streaming, or not so-called non-theatrical rights, which often mean festivals or um, other sort of community cinemas and things like this. And um, they usually license the rights for 10, 15, 20 years and uh, try and exploit them in any way they can. Um, this is obviously just an example of how that split on a big Hollywood film. But uh, if we look at this graph, you can see that it's split into quite a lot of different uh, revenue windows, which uh, would roughly exist in uh, a sm smaller budget independent films. The ratios would be slightly different. But it, it's quite a complex rights um, uh, exploitation model. And what the export rise has proven is that it's also been quite uh, difficult to sort of maintain. And it's because it's a complex system, once it, uh, it, enough pressure is created on it, it starts to creak quite, creak quite um, heavily. Um, so the streaming trend and the new studio's tentpole focus and the rising cost of cinema viewing uh, has meant that traditional distributors are now very squeezed um, because theatrical release is increasingly more expensive. Making profit is much harder because of the costs uh, and the fight for screen space with big blockbusters. And uh, theatrical to begin with, it was often the, the loss leader in this industry. So only a fragment of really theatrically released films would turn a profit in the cinemas. Um, but you would still have home entertainment as the, the rights windows where you would recoup marketing expenses and usually turn a profit. This was usually done mainly through DVD sales and selling the film to broadcasters or um, pay TV. But now DVD space is pretty much dead. Um, the electronic sales or rental has not replaced this, which probably you're well aware by now. Uh, broadcasters, they're still fighting for the survival with the uh, streaming services. So their focus has shifted to TV series or big tentpole um, films. And uh, this shift in model has impacted the independent film space quite significantly. And the other impact this has had on the international um, sellers is that the market for buyers is smaller, so they are more risk averse, and therefore they also pre-buy films less, as it's more riskier to buy an unfinished film. So um, just as a sort of example, a, a pre-buy is when a distributor buys a film based on purely the script and cast attached, which is often done at a slightly lower price as the as they take the risk of execution, whereas uh, it is safer, of course, to buy a finished film because you already know how it looks, but then usually there's more competition or you might have actually uh, missed your chance and somebody else has bought it. But the risk of buying a film um, 
boy has made is well it's a creative industry so it's it's very high <laughs> the directors are not necessarily sellers so they, they the way they pitch films often might leave room for interpre interpretation that then cause confusion or then there's something goes wrong with the shoot so that's something that distributors increasingly have to factor in and with the toughening market of less revenue streams coming from home entertainment or tv it's increasingly harder for distributors to find so-called sure bets um so this has pushed the prices and therefore budgets lower which has affected the ability to finance and uh, package films and in addition the boom in tv series that's caused a um the sort of the boom in TV series has caused a scramble for talent and uh, casting, especially significant talent, one that's enough to sort of justify the price of a pre buy to distributors is uh, increasingly harder. So, I mean, I, I know this sounds all like doom and gloom, and uh, it, it kind of is. And uh, this was even before the pandemic, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to more positive things a bit later. But uh, obviously, the pandemic is a big part of our world at the moment uh it's caused severe disruption we're by no means the only industry i'm well aware of it but i as i could see from the brooks university's master classes a lot of them touched upon covid as a as a topic and um as you can see this is what i previously said was already in motion before the pandemic hit so once the pandemic hit, the situation can only just increase or extrapolate it. It just sort of, it felt like it was the whole uh, process was on steroids because since now even the theatrical window just disappeared and uh, it disappeared overnight. So distributors, they can't release bigger films that require uh, theatrical prestige, which then drives up the value of the home entertainment side. Festival driven films, so called, which one could say the quality film quality films that require a premiere in either Cannes, Venice, Toronto, Sundance to break out and find the sort of dedicated audience that then builds the the reputation of the film uh, are harder to find. The festivals have either cancelled or they significantly reduced their premieres. And similarly, like there's this ongoing debate of what is an online festival? It's, it's kind of like do. Do you hear a tree fall in the forest with no one's around? It's, it's, it's that kind of thing like, how do you generate the festival buzz when there's not that condensed sort of excited, excited feeling of being at a festival and discovering new films? Does that happen online? Um, there's been some great examples of festivals sort of really thinking outside the box and creating temporary solutions for it. But overall, from a, like a wider industry perspective, it has definitely impacted the way independent films um, can be sold internationally. So overall, distributors are fighting for survival harder than ever. Um, so that means they're increasingly more conservative when it comes to buying, which impacts us, the sellers, and through us, the, the filmmakers. And in this, the, sort of the last straw, of course, is that the pandemic has made it the pandemic has made it really difficult to shoot films as well, um, especially in Western countries. Um, and the cost has gone up because of all the necessary COVID precautions, the rise in insurance costs. So um, from our perspective, what this means is that any film that requires a festival premiere is on hold if it's already been shot or uh, it has noticeably lost value and distributors they're less likely to buy prospective titles or ones that required theatrical releases because they don't know when they can release those films so at the moment they if they pre-buy the more prestigious titles they only focus on the top end of projects the so-called sure bets which because of the talent shortage are increasingly harder to finance so what that has meant for a company like us, who, as I previously mentioned, did a mixture of genre films and sort of cast driven independent films that were in the, say, three to eight million US dollar budget range. 
we've had to quite drastically refocus our effort and we're at the moment almost purely a um a genre uh, outfit um we do still look at uh, uh non-genre films or cast driven films but uh increasingly to survive this year and which now seems to be at least 2021 as well so to survive 2022 now 2021 possibly 2022 we've shifted quite drastically into acquiring mainly genre films uh, because they're easier to produce um they're lighter in production so for example the reef is an australian production as well australia can shoot they don't need to fly in cast because it's a film that they can cast using Australian cast. Um, we had another genre film that was a sci-fi satire that shot in Malta because Malta managed COVID very well. And again, British talent. So with some pre-shoot quarantining methods, we could fly those actors in. And it was a contained shoot uh, during the summer uh, when the situation wasn't as bad. Um, we are also looking at American projects like we've always done um but with that it's like there's always that question of how will the production manage the covid situation so that because the worst thing for a small budget film is that you go into production and then you need to halt production because if you're batman shooting in pinewood obviously it's bad when patterson gets covid but it's such a juggernaut that they will they can afford to re pick up the shoot, it hurts, but they just can't let that fail. But for a small indie film where the finance has just been squeezed through, that might crush the film. So green lighting or was it pushing films over, over the production line, that's increasingly difficult at the moment. So it, in addition to the, all the usual moving pieces that you had as a, as a, um, independent salesperson on a normal year now that you've got the shooting location uh actors quarantining all of that playing part it, it's become increasingly difficult it, it is still possible and there's a lot of innovative ways of shooting but uh, at the moment like films that are more contained genre driven and um also uh feel like they could be sort of either shot or moved easily to a country where the situation is better, they're, they're easier, easier to get into production. Um, obviously, this is only from our perspective, the, 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 the sort of the part of the industry we are in. So uh, there are other aspects of the industry, like the mid-level mid feature producers. I'm not 100% sure what they're doing at the moment, but it is increasingly difficult for them to um, keep projects uh, going. So um, just on uh, the la last bit of this, the, the other reason why we've sort of quite radically shifted into this uh, model is that uh, as we, we all read from the news, it seems like the COVID period is not just 2020 and maybe 2021. It, it seems like the COVID might be here a longer period of time. So we've all had to sort of re-evaluate what we can produce because we're sort of in this weird position where there are some films that can't be released, where, which are the more prestige, prestigious theatrical titles, but then there are also some uh, distributors that are hungry for content, which luckily the genre side can help fill because a lot of the genre films, they've got a very dedicated audience and they're less dependent on theatrical or you can do day and dates where you don't need that much money out of theatrical. It's sort of a part of the, the whole range of uh, a distributor's release pattern. So it doesn't need to be the key revenue driver because mo a lot of the money will be made online. So that's why that these can be sort of packaged, financed, shot and released during COVID because they're sort of lighter and the, mo the business model at the moment, at least seems to support it. So just uh, sort of moving on to, again, sort of slightly wider sort of view of the market. I thought uh, 
obviously we've been talking about the streamers a bit and i'm sure a lot of your lectures have been uh, talking about the big streamers so I might be repeating what's been said before but uh, as you know the pandemic and its lockdowns and the stay at home culture they've given the, the platforms quite a massive boost so just the latest news was that Disney Plus has gone from 27 million to 95 million subscribers in, in a very short span of time. Netflix broke 200 million subscribers quite recently. HBO Max has already 40 million subscribers after its 2019 launch. And that means they're now two, two years ahead of their schedule in subscriber growth. And um, Roku, which is a AVOD platform, has also gained 51 million new accounts within a year. That's all. Well, obviously, some of this was going to happen despite the pandemic, but it's given this massive boost in the streaming space, which is why general thinking is that uh, the industry has suddenly jumped five years ahead in time from uh, where we were headed already. So we've suddenly landed in this sort of streaming future that was slowly being built, and uh, it was just being kickstarted for. Uh, five years obviously that means that it's not just the big big streamers there's a whole constellation of streaming it's, it's probably more causing like consumer fatigue by now and there's going to be a lot of uh, competition consolidation death as you can see like the there's already a few at least quibi is not with us anymore that they, they their content library was acquired by uh roku um so that means there's also opportunities for um, independent filmmakers and uh, salespeople, but it, it's going to be a tricky landscape to navigate for the for the coming years. Um, and sort of as the pandemic e eases, the quick big question is: um, Will we remain in a streaming future, or will some of the theatrical return? That's Im impossible for me to predict, but. Uh, I, 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 me and my colleagues are fairly sure that most of this sort of development is not going to go away, that we're sort of going to be in something like a world that's something like this with theatrical on the side, hopefully. But the big question is, is, is theatrical going to be more a event kind of a thing that you go to, or is it going to return as a big revenue um, model? And the answer might be different depending on which part of the the industry you sit in. Obviously, if you're Disney, you can't wait for the cinemas to open. But if you're an independent distributor, will you have enough of the space or will you need to start doing bespoke releases? That's going to be the interesting thing to see. And um, looking at the your upcoming lectures, maybe someone will address it or, or, or already has. But I'm not the expert on that topic. Um, but the other challenging thing with the, the distribution space is that it favors um, TV series a lot uh, because they're uh, the preferred content for both export platforms and um, broadcasters. Not the only, but part of the reason is that because you can get more episodes, as in content, in one go. The, you can brand your platform with exclusive shows. That means that. There's also more seasons to help drive or keep subscribers. And um, this sort of further boosts the, the change in the industry. Uh, so the big question for the film industry is what happens after the pandemic, as I said, and what will the new world look like? Um, and as I said, it's obviously risky or even possible to say anything with certainty. Um, the last year has definitely <laughs> taught me that. But uh, what I can share, uh, sort of some of the trends that we're seeing taking place in the industry at the moment. And um, for example, for sales and distribution companies, a lot of us are aiming for a more vertical business model. So sales agents are becoming more involved with distribution through online revenue models. Uh, for example, in ways that they can exploit rights in countries where local distributors haven't bought a film because you can do it digitally. The, the revenue streams from these are quite small. Um, so it's going to be a volume business. So you need to build pipelines in different countries where you can uh, um, 
try and find ways to exploit your rights, or you find these sort of one man band uh, companies that can do it for you or with you. Um, sales engines are also becoming more active in producing and developing and um, as well as financing. There are companies, well, our owner has taken steps in both directions. We as a sales company are also producing now. Uh, our owner also owns a uh, um, purely online distribution, uh, li library-based distribution company that is operating as volume business and they might become more integrated in the future. Um, but all, all these developments sort of help us take our fate a bit more into our own hands so that we're not just at the mercy of whatever the buyers are looking for at the moment. So, um, so the sales agents who have a finger on the pulse when it comes to markets will aim to come on board projects much earlier than before so that they can help develop and package projects for the market. Um, this has already increased competition over filmmaking talent, um, especially directors and writers, even some producers. So there's sort of earlier alliances being formed. And the similar trend is visible in the streaming space. So if you Google a lot of the Amazons and Netflixes, they're, they're signing a lot of these huge exclusive talent deals. And it's, it's all part of this of trying to find a sort of pinpoint key talent early and sort of attach them to you either as a company or as a platform. So that sort of talent competition is 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 heating up definitely especially in the us it's uh, it's definitely landed in the uk and i think mo most of europe is following sweden's on that path definitely so the, the fight for talent is intensifying so a lot of producers they're attaching themselves to talent as well a lot earlier so there's news of either production companies formed together with talent so that can be either in front or behind camera talent um or uh, production, some production companies are also becoming management companies, like talent management. That's a bigger trend in the US, but again, has happened a bit in the, in the European countries as well. And um, I'd say there's still a possibility for filmmakers to still break out in film, but this is increasingly more difficult because the market is shrinking and it's, it's sort of who commissions what and like a lot of films are getting directly commissioned by platforms. So that's led to a lot of talent migrating to TV and platforms natively. So uh, especially because the TV and the platforms, there's still a growing segment in the industry. But also a lot of talent, they're becoming quite platform and format agnostic. So they don't care if it's a film or a TV series or short form is probably going to follow, even despite QB's downfall, that it's still a space that is healthy. And especially for young filmmakers, it's probably a good way to sort of break into the industry and start testing your, your strength. There's definitely, I've come across great projects where the talent has been making short form earlier and uh, they've sort of proven their creative skills through that and then producers have picked them up and um, but they've still already had an audience they've got an audience feedback through that and obviously with youtube and a lot of other online platforms some see short form as the main tool but uh, i would dare to claim that the majority of um, fiction filmmakers or fiction creators still want to make uh, slightly longer form content for one of the platforms or um, either film because usually that means you that, that's still the best way to get enough resources to create good looking fiction projects but obviously there's no blanket answer for all, all types of filmmakers but um and also anecdotally this seems to be a more natural trend for younger uh dare I say millennial filmmakers um is there, but I don't have any sort of actual sort of research or statistics to back this up. But um, that's definitely something that I've witnessed through friends and colleagues and uh, associates. So as I've mentioned a few times, a lot has happened in, uh, in one year, but most of these trends were already in motion before the pandemic. So the future is of course uncertain, but I, I generally do feel there are opportunities for filmmakers or you can use the word content creators, which some people hate. Uh, I, I kind of understand that. And um, 
even opportunities for companies working in the um, independent film space. But um, I, I think it just requires a new flexible way of thinking and uh, an understanding that the market is not disappearing, but it is definitely changing a lot. Um, so maybe there's a bit of a ham-fisted way of turning a positive spin on this at the end, but um, I thought this would maybe be a good time to open the sessions to questions or comments from the audience.